uh, being exposed not only from the actions of um, the people they're contending with or against, but they're also being exposed as a result of a side effect of the population as a whole uh, encountering what you could call an awakening wave, uh, a Kaminoric effect, if you will, of uh, information coming on out and the breakdown of the legacy media, meaning that the um, fence or the um, the wall that was between uh, the citizens and what the elite were really doing is crumbling in and of itself. That has a tendency to expose more. Each one of these little nuggets of exposure leads to further and so on. So, yeah, the elite have got a real uh, hard row, row to uh, hoe here for the next um, uh, few years to just survive. Do you think that the elite, they're just going to sit back and just let everything completely be, you know, everything taken away from them? Or, or, or are they going to hit back? Does your report say anything about the elite, like, hitting back or doing anything, creating events or anything like that? Uh, we don't have anything at the moment uh, indicating a um, uh, anything like a false flag or a coordinated attack or that sort of a... A response. Now we have to bear in mind that there's, we would fall into a trap by saying the elite and thinking of a monolithic, uh, centrally controlled, uh, single kind of point reaction, uh, just as uh, uh, erroneous as calling uh, the the um, vast um, amount of people that work for the United States federal government as the government. There's just not a single thing going on with the elite. There's a um, uh, many disparate motivations. So some of the people are going to cut and run. We've seen this in the data sets uh, at various levels as the minions depart. Uh, the um, practical reality that we're facing has uh, a power pyramid at its top that has been controlled by for some 70 plus years by um, uh, secrecy, secret societies that have been infiltrated and are being used to hide uh, criminals. Uh, the criminals are both criminals against um, uh, the populace economically and against the populace uh, in many other different forms, including the pedophiles. And so the criminality has been hidden by the juxtaposition of the secret societies being um, ubiquitous throughout government, as well as in the media, so there's and you know the uh, justice system and so on. So uh, the uh, the wall that has been uh, held in place was essentially held there and kept there by the media, by the legacy media, because as long as you would uh, bring up anything that the elite didn't want to have discussed, you would be ridiculed. You'll notice, for instance, that I could sit here right now and say that. Um, the Queen of England is known to have killed um, at least uh, uh, 10 uh, native uh, children from B.C. Canada, and I'll never be sued, okay? I can say that this woman may in all probability be uh, demonically possessed, and I'll never be sued by them for any anything. I could say this about virtually anybody I chose, uh, these kind of words, and you'll never be sued because they don't want this to get to a legal uh, issue. They'll never sue you to try and protect themselves that way. They don't care. Their response in the past would be to have the media come on out and do their damage control and build a wall for them and basically ridicule you into silence, just like the UFO people that have a, an encounter and see an unidentified aerial phenomenon and report it to the um uh, authorities and media in the past would be ridiculed, and so we were set up to mentally not see these things. That whole mental process is broken down due to circumstances that we needn't go into at the moment, but it's really giving the elite a, uh, a huge problem on many different levels. Now, in your report, you, you have something in there that says there's going to be a global backlash against the media corporations as part of this shifting narrative over 2017. Uh, there's a national movement against the media. W what do you mean by this? It's going to come out that um, major corporations 
uh, whether it was by direction of the board of directors or whether they were infiltrated by a secret society that all worked as a, uh, as a whole within that corporation. But these corporations have been feeding into our media a, um, um, a mental mind control kind of a thing uh, for the past 40 or 50 years. These uh, organizations, it'll come out this year as to what they've been putting into their um, media offerings, their entertainment offerings, and how um, negative it was for us as a social order and for individuals. And they'll, there'll start being suits against these companies. And then there will be uh, a giant sort of um, uh, a mom's march against uh, the evil uh, uh, entertainment industry. And to a certain extent, it, it shows in our data sets is taking on some of the language of fundamentalism. Uh, but it's not religious in nature. It's more of a just an outrage. A um, uh, it's it's very much driven by feminine energy. It's very much driven by uh, protecting the house. It's very much driven by a uh, feeling of um, unacknowledged victim uh, status in the sense that you didn't realize you were being victimized. And and for so some of the examples would would have companies such as uh, the cartoon manufacturers. Uh, be sued and then as a subset of that because of the um, uh, sexualization and uh, the hidden messages and subliminals within the the cartoons they're making and so uh, it'll get to the point where the legacy media and the, especially the broadcasters uh, are just going to be raked over the coals I mean they're just going to be uh, eviscerated as people start tearing through their offerings and pointing out all of the um, uh, hidden subliminals that are causing a lot of the problems that we have at the moment. So imagine a situation that uh, is quite uh, bizarre to think about. But uh, in the 1890s, there is a resurgence of the Masonic lodges in the northeast of the uh, United States. Over the course of the next 50, 60 years, that uh, lodge is uh, actually in the resurgence. It was 100% infiltrated by a particular small core of, of people uh, that took the lodge in a direction that it should never have been taken. And it ended up um, hiding uh, a, a network of individuals uh, that were uh, coerce and coercible because they were all pedophiles. Now, one of the things that they did was to decide that uh, sometime in the late 30s and early 40s, as the uh, war was getting ramped up in the U.S., they decided they would start using the new media that had come on out, radio, television, or radio and movies, to start prepping the population for their grand scheme because these people were thinking in 100-year time frames. And so in their minds, the idea was, oh, well, uh, we're pedophiles. We need victims. Let's get our victims all prepped by putting all this stuff in the um, cartoons and get at them from an early age. And this will uh, do two things. It will ensure a ready supply of easily uh, or more easily obtainable victims. And at the same time, it will bring out anybody that's like ourselves. And there'll be more of us, which means that we'll be individually more protected. Bear in mind, these individuals feel threatened constantly because of their uh, uh, deviant nature, and they know that discovery leads to uh, quite terrible things for them. And that's actually been what we've been living through. And so some of the corporations that we laud, and there's no point in me going into names, um, uh, are going to be uh, first sued as the truth starts coming on out, and it'll come on out with a couple of brave individuals that said, look, I, I watched your cartoons for, you know, X number of years, and I'm a twisted, horrible wreck, and I'm going to sue you for it. And that is the kind of like um, uh, finger uh, being pulled from the dam that starts the whole onrush that later on over the course of this year starts uh, changing the uh, nature of corporate culture uh, across the Western world. In your data sets, does it show that like Trump is actually trying to release, and Bill Holter calls them truth bombs. Is he actually releasing truth bombs and seeing how the public reacts and the corporate media reacts? Do you see anything about that? Uh, that would go to intent. Okay. And so, no, our report doesn't do that kind of intent. It does, it discusses the, um, uh, projection of events and the language about them. So, so that would really be speculating, uh, about somebody's intent. And I, I wouldn't know, uh, why they were doing them 
uh, but it indeed does show that that will be done. And in fact, we're able to look at a um, uh, enough of it arising that I was able to label it as strategy three, the idea of creating a third force. Those those words also appeared in the data. And the idea is that um, <clears throat> if we had faction A and faction B, faction A is now the um, uh, disloyal opposition uh, and is going to cause problems for the new ascendant faction B. One way to derail faction A would be to take a large chunk of their um, popular support and create a third force that was not necessarily opposed to faction B because it had been liberated by some level of truth. And that's at least the thinking that's being illustrated in the um, in the report. And so we've and we've got some. Uh, factual things on the ground here these last uh, few weeks, especially, that would point towards that being a, an effective forecast. I'm going to get into the economy right now. In your report, you have a, a section in there that talks about the economy. What do you see for the market uh, during the year of 2017? Are the market, I mean, there are people out there saying the market's going to go to 100,000. Uh, are you seeing this? Uh, where do you see the markets going? Uh, if you mean like, um, uh, shares st the stock market. Yeah, yeah the the uh, indications in the data are that we'll be discussing uh, that not you and not just you and I, but the more general population will be discussing the idea of a Dow at 125,000 some point later on this year, and so uh, it's it it's pointing to hyperinflation, and the hyperinflation we see in the report uh, really appears as a result of the chaos we go through. Uh, that's indicated from March through May as a bunch of currencies go into crises and a bunch of the um, uh, percolating pots of uh, crises and, and coffee all come to a boil all at once uh, in this three or four month period of time. And then the response by the Fed is basically to, um, uh, I guess you'd have to say, abandon the dollar or not support it anyway and let the dollar uh, be totally debased in order to try and support the system as a whole. Um, the mechanisms are not showing in the data sets. It's not like it's um, a, 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 an organized plan or a playbook, but we get some hints as to what's going to go on. So my, my response is that I, what I think will occur is that um, any any interest rate raising is going to be meaningless in the ama uh, vast amounts of quantitative easing, which basically is debasement of the dollar to uh, a huge level, and the uh, subsequent currency crises would make sense under those circumstances. Now, the last time we spoke, we talked about the economy not doing well, where ATMs were going to run out of currency, people were going to lose pensions, the housing market was going to go bust. Are we still on track for that? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. And in fact, it's baked in the cake. That part of uh, uh, we have to go through a, a truth and reconciliation period of time. Um, at a macro level, we've been living under um, an illusionary uh, veil of lies from uh, economically uh, for at least the last 40 years. I mean, ever since we got off the gold standard in the 70s, really, it's all been um, uh, lie it, fake it in, until you make it kind of stuff and lie it into existence. So we have to go through a uh, slap in the face from reality as the people in India, for instance, are, are doing at the moment with their currency issues. And as we go through the currency crises, those things will show up. We'll have ATM shutdowns. We'll have uh, riots in the food stores, you know, uh, Venezuela type period of time. Uh, it may lead to uh, individual states having to call out National Guard in order to restore order. Uh, the chaos that we're going to go through, I think, would be more representative of um, the 1918 um, uh, period of time and the rejection of globalism then and the uh, outbreak of new ideas and so forth that led to the Roaring Twenties than, in fact, the, the many... Um, people saying we're actually echoing 29 and that kind of a crash. So, yes, we're going to go into a depression, I think, and not a recession, but a real actual acknowledgement of a depression as the currency has come unwound. And it's going to have huge ripples in our society because so much of it is built on, well, all of it is, is organized around a currency that is based on debt. The currency is not based on wealth. It's not based on growth. It's only based on debt. 
and the continuing assumption of more debt, which equals a Ponzi scheme. And once you get to a certain stage, all Ponzi schemes collapse. Now, when you say the unraveling of the uh, the currency, uh, you mean the dollar losing complete value, where it will be worthless? Where uh, it'll be yeah, worthless? Con- confidence. Correct. Exactly. Correct. When in. in we shouldn't be shocked. It's happened in, in uh, this country. It's happened repeatedly uh, since we've been in existence uh, as a nation. I think there have been five or six major currency uh, schemes in the in uh, the USA uh, interspersed with long periods of a gold standard. And the long periods of gold standards were basically when we grew. China started paper money over 6,000 years ago, and they routinely crash a currency every 27 to 40 years and have to start up with a new one. And it it has to do with confidence. Once you lose confidence in the dollar, it takes them a while to get you to have confidence in some other representation of money, some other currency. And bear in mind, it's currency that you pass back and forth with dollars. Currency is not money. It's um, one step removed. It's something that allows you to do business and have a current transaction and exchange current energy with people without necessarily having to mess with moving real money, which, you know, could be silver and could be quite heavy, that sort of thing. So uh, the currencies are going to cause us um, uh, real problems because of their age, the, the, that there's no value or wealth in them. And uh, we're at that point where we've got to uh, overcome to get beyond and get ahead. And at least in this particular point, uh, there's enough of us that are waking up that we can sit here and contemplate what we're looking at for the next five and six years and so on and do some planning as opposed to have to react from crises to crises to crises over that same six-year period of time. Does that mean that the dollar will no longer be the reserve currency of the world? That's already occurred. The petrodollar has died. We know this now because um, we have, uh, I don't know how many nations in negative interest rates. All of those are Western, uh, currencies that are dollar, uh, pegged or, or based. And now people are trading in, uh, oil around the dollar without involving themselves in the dollar at all. So the petrodollar has died. It's no longer true that the U S dollar is reserve currency. And we're going to find that out really rapidly this year when it's going to turn out that the, uh, fed, uh, federal reserve bank, which is not part of the federal government, has no reserves, and is not a bank, is going to try and issue or trying to buy a debt that's being issued by the U.S. government that won't be bought by foreign nations. So in our in our data sets, we have data for a period of time later this year, probably in midsummer or, or later, in which uh, bond offerings for U.S. treasuries uh, are only purchased by the Fed. So it's, you're starting to make and eat your own dog food. And that cycle uh, doesn't last very long. Now, I just want to break down how this is going to occur throughout this year, because as we get closer and closer to these type of events, you get more information, correct? Correct. Yes. So, uh, I mean, are, are we at the point where this is going to really start to break down in, in this year? Are we going to see inflation? Are we going to see the the uh, ATMs dry up with currency? Are we going to see maybe a credit freeze? I mean, you, do you see this happening this year? Yes, actually within uh, a very short period of time. So this is the first part of February. We should be uh, well into it by middle of March. Uh, crises should be and chaos should be more the um, daily operating uh, mode than not. And, and yes, we will see that this year. We've seen a lot of these data sets shift from long-term data into short-term and now into immediacy data. The immediacy data has uh, effectiveness from three days out to about the end of the third week. So some of the immediacy data stuff is forecasting that we're dealing with now. For the next report is is already forecasting uh, events into early March, and that's not that far away. So what does the Fed do at this point? I mean, are they just going to sit back or are they going to start creating currency like crazy? Uh, the latter. Bear in mind, these people are not very smart, okay? They're mm-hmm. um, no offense to the general population at all intended, but these individuals are academics in the Fed. None of these people have ever had a job. None of them have ever had to you know, make anything, build anything, create value on their own. They only know things from a, a book uh, fashion. Plus, uh, schooling, <laughs> academic schooling, especially in the United States or the Western world, has one 
uh, purpose, and that is matriculation, to graduate. In order to graduate, you have to regurgitate the uh, thoughts of old dead people. Schooling does not teach uh, people to think originally. It doesn't even teach you to think. It teaches you to memorize facts and spit them back out. And um, as a result of which, none of the people that are running the Fed, all of whom are academics and trained and been in their careers and done everything from that viewpoint, none of those individuals can think their way out of a paper sack. So they will try exactly what they've done in the past because they think it is working. Let me also state they're so isolated from the general population and what's going on that they think everything they've done so far has worked and in fact was a good thing to do. And so they'll do a quantitative easing. They may raise rates, but it won't matter because of the um, uh, actual rate of inflation going uh, will be uh, uh, far greater at the at like the mortgage rates and so on at that level of things. And they'll try a huge level of quantitative easing. Now, in the past, we've had a weird, interesting sort of a situation. So for since 2008, all of the uh, quantitative easing, which is uh, the creation of digital money, which we would say is printing money, all of that has led to very, very, very low inflation rates in an otherwise deflationary environment. And so this has occurred because the Fed set themselves up for it. They told all the banks out there, basically, they said, um, give us your assets, your excess reserves, and we'll give you money for it. And so the uh, banks, not being stupid, they gamed the system and they would get money from the Fed and they would use it to acquire excess reserves, which they would then give to the Fed as collateral to get more money. So the banks never loaned money into the system at all. And so the Fed at that time was, was forced to keep lowering rates in order to keep the system going until they eventually got to the point where we're at now where they're considering negative rates. And so they decided in 2015 that they were going to try the opposite and try and uh, lever themselves out the way they've done in all previous uh, crises. But in all previous crises, they've never, ever had this excessive reserves uh, stash and we'll give you a cash uh, policy. So that led to this circuitous uh, eating of money that didn't get into the general population. Thus, we only had marginal inflation in those things that we really need and not a generalized um, uh, visible inflation everywhere. And so that's going to fall away. Plus, the media, legacy media that used to lie about all the inflation is falling away. And under these two circumstances of the excessive reserves going away because of long-term rates going up and therefore banks can make more money loaning money out now than they can giving it, than they can, what they used to do is they'd buy a house uh, or, or take over a foreclosed house, then they'd run to the Fed and show the Fed the deed and the Fed would give them money for holding this excessive reserve. Now they're, they're actually inclined to say, well, look, we're only making 1% maybe on this uh, money that we've got for this deed for the house. So we're just going to sell the house and then we'll loan that money out. And we'll make three and four and five and six and seven percent as rates go up. And basically they won't start, uh, they won't um, recycle the excessive reserves back into the Fed anymore. And so they'll stop gaming that system. And the minute that individual banks do that, then those indiv individual banks become conduits for uh, that currency to start going into the general economy. And thus, we're going to get to this uh, situation where the um, abandonment of gaming the Fed is going to create uh, inflation very rapidly, and the Fed will be too uh, locked into uh, uh, easing, uh, and we'll get into hyperinflation, and then they'll start trying to chase the interest rates after that, and that's when it shows us coming all unglued at the local regional bank level. So it's going to be chaotic. It's going to be wild. When you say hyperinflation, like, can you give an example of what you mean with hyperinflation? Well, the Dow would be five times what it is now or six times what it is now, over $125,000, which means that the money's been debased by a, that same factor. So if you're spending... Um, uh, $2 for a, a gallon of gas now, uh, you can imagine you'll be spending 12 to $15 for a gallon of gas. And that's just the start. Okay. And, and is this going to be a, a global phenomenon? What happens to the other countries, Europe? No, actually, uh, the breakdown goes a different way, okay? Uh, within our data sets, we've always had Canada and Australia dollars because they call them dollars at some level and, and talk about their currency that way, it, it lumps in with our dollar and I've got to go through and separate it out. So I know these two um, 
uh, in particular, as well as Ecuador, because they're tied to the U.S. dollar. They show up within our, our USA POP data sets that way. But the Australian dollar and the Canadian dollar are actually going to strengthen uh, against our failing dollar. Once we get to a certain point, the USA dollar starts going down, and uh, commodity-rich countries like uh, Canada and Australia will start rising because there's going to be a... Um, uh, a commodity purchase boom by the uh, the only buyer on the planet, really, at the moment, uh, which is China. And so uh, those two con- countries go up. Europe is going to uh, not survive as uh, the euro, and that's going to be uh, horrific for everybody over there in a lot of different ways. Here in the United States, what about the jobs? Do you, do you, I mean, when this all hits, uh, we're going to see mass layoffs? Um, there's a lot of that in there. Uh, so, but, um, it's not going to be a, uh, all at once kind of thing. It's not going to be all in a week. So for instance, the data sets show that, uh, as we get into fall, the regional banking crises really starts precipitating the, uh, rolling out of the crises in the quote, uh, educational system, which is really the school system. And by that, I'm talking about the colleges. And uh, so uh, because of the lending problems break down there and because the schools themselves are having problems, uh, we have a number of individuals that aren't working in that industry anymore and aren't attending school. So we get a lot of that showing up. But in terms of mass layoffs, uh, it's different now because you don't really have a situation of mega employers that are going to say lay off 20 or 30,000 people per day for a whole week. It just doesn't really get to that level. The The problems show up in um, uh, regional banks and then what we might think of as the regional or mid-tier companies, so say 500 employees or less, and those are the guys that get hit by this first. Now, the good news is that uh, humans are not stupid. They're motivated by uh, their own uh, personal welfare, and so there are going to be people that are going to start working out solutions as we get into the crises just because they're desperate enough to do it, and some of these solutions uh, show as being uh, valid across the nation as a whole as we go through these next couple of years. But it's going to be a rough couple of years, there's absolutely no question. Will it get as bad as um, uh, Greece or Cyprus or, you know, um, uh, Venezuela? Probably but I don't think that'll be uh, ubiquitous across the country all at the same time. So you think this is going to last for a couple of years where people are struggling? This is not just going to be like, you know, five five years, at least, at least five five years. years. We have these, uh, we have these two broad um, memes, if you will. Okay. And one of them is that we've separated out into what we call USA population, USA pop. Then there's global pop. Now, USA is a, is, as a population is a subset of the global population. But just separating it and looking at the two, we see that there's these like counter, juxt, or counter juxtaposition on waves. So as we're going down because we've got to deal with all of the problems that originate uh, from the 40 or 50 years of being lied to constantly about everything economic and everything, period, uh, we've got to get real on things. Those people that are already real, that are living in what we might call the emerging markets, their trend lines are definitively up. So um, so it'll be really bad here in uh, the Western world, and it'll affect places uh, like the North America very uh, negatively for at least five years. But um, it's going to be sort of a good five years because we get to destroy the past and rebuild ourselves more healthy. And at the same time, we've got people on the outside, so to speak, that are doing well, that will also be able to help us along, that are not, um, uh, you know, anti-USA pop, right? That, that see that, oh, well, uh, they really do need the assistance and this kind of thing. So we get to have a new relationship with the planet as a population, and we got to work our way through uh, some of the lies of a dying empire, if you will. And this will be a good thing for us in the end. And, uh, you know, birds will sing, sing, the sun will come on out, all of this kind of thing. But we're going to have a rough period that will be these five years. And in some areas of the, of the country, probably longer uh, because they're going to get to uh, get to it harder or, you know, later, that kind of a thing. But, yeah, the 
uh, you know, uh, what do they say? You can ignore reality as long as you want, but you can't ignore the consequences of ignoring reality. And we're at that point right now. So as we're seeing uh, hyperinflation, what happens to gold, silver, cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin? Do they move up? Do they move down? Oh, um, certainly. No, no, no. They, they shoot through the, uh, the roof because the hyperinflation will chase real assets in a in a um, definitively human way if you've gotten um uh you know a, a big windfall of you know several hundred thousand uh dollars and you realize these hundred thousand dollars are less valuable than the money you'd gotten last month well you're going to get rid of them you're not going to hold them and they'll try and chase uh, silver gold and bitcoin and very rapidly in our our data sets uh the silver and gold in the united states go to no offer that is to say, nobody's offering to sell any simply because the mechanisms uh, here, uh, well, basically what happens is this. In our data sets, we've got all these lies that are uh, breaking down at an economic level. Some of these lies uh, include the idea of setting the, the value for metals and such within a paper um, uh, derived or derivative contract kind of a place. And those lies end up going away and we go to no offer here because people see that oh look if you go and try and sell your your silver in the same place that they trade these silver contracts you'll get maybe a hundred dollars an ounce for the stuff but if you hold out and actually sell it as physical silver to a guy who's willing to come and pay you you'll get 345 an ounce for it and that guy is probably going to work on getting it over to china where they'll pay 500 an ounce for it and so real arbitrage comes back to uh, real goods again as the confidence factor uh, uh, goes in the dollar. So what we see is a uh, sometime in this crisis period, March through May, uh, we're going to get a much more um, uh, visible or public face on the uh, stupidity of the Fed. And when you start having a lot of individuals that are respected, uh, saying very negative things about the people that are involved in the Fed and pointing out that they're not brilliant, don't know what they're doing, and are in fact a criminal scheme from the get-go. Well, confidence is going to go real quick. And, and, it, and so our data sets show that, that that is coincident with the problems in the regional banks and so on, because it all relates to, to currencies, and currencies have basically a single crisis this year. And that, is, that crisis at its core is confidence. So what this sounds like to me is that we're going to be going through this reset and this reset's going to be painful. Is the central bank still going to be in existence um, after all this is said and done? Uh, I would hesitate to use the word reset, okay? Okay. The, the reason that I hesitate to use that is because I'm uh, not being <clears throat> um, uh, fixated on the language per se, but there are nuances that need to be brought up. A reset language, if you use that word, it implies uh, there's a connotation involved that there's an authority that is making that reset occur and that this reset is a, an organized kind of a thing. And so we do not show that connotation within our data sets. Uh, so I don't use that word. Uh, because, for instance, they say, oh, there's going to be a reset in the value of the Iraqi dinar and all those people that bought dinar for, um, you know, parts of a penny are going to be mega rich. And that reset and the language, whenever you see this language in the woo-woo world, uh, reset used, it is always going to this idea of what I call the external savior myth. That is that there's going to be someone outside the system that's going to cause it to be saved. And that is not the case that we have here. We don't have a, a, a reset. We have all of humanity struggling to, well, especially because of the Western world, but we have the Western empire struggling to come out of um, uh, empireness and the lies that have held us all in that state of mind for like, as I say, the last 40, 50 years. After all this, who controls the monetary system? Is it still the central bank? No, I, we don't. We have the central bank sort of um, uh, dying in the sense of not being killed, but dying like um, uh, competition. Like, you know, they're the, the local barista that has bad coffee. Nobody just goes there anymore. They just, yeah, yuck, I've tasted that. It's no good. Let me go get my silver gold Bitcoin. And Bitcoin shows up as being very uh, useful 
to the point where we as a social order end up having slang terms for decibits and millibits. And so uh, we know that the slang will evolve because there's forecasts of that within our work. We just don't know what those words are going to be, but we'll have words for millibits that are, that are um, equivalent to the word for a penny or for a lira, that kind of a thing, right? Because we'll be using it. We'll be transacting in that. Cliff, do your data sets see anything that has to do with war or anything like that? Uh, there's a lot of it, but no, we don't have... Uh, there's a lot of the grumbly level war language, all right? But in general, that appears to be winding down in the long-term data sets. So uh, it is as though... Uh, faction A, uh, when they were in control, had so much of the resources going into uh, the wars that they were able to sustain those because they were constantly being paid for. And now that we have two conditions arising, which is that faction A is no longer in control of those resources, and those resources are dying in and of themselves because they were currency-based, then there's no longer... Uh, support for all of these grumbling kind of wars around. So in other words, um, uh, explicitly the data sets show that the uh, USA POP funding uh, for what we call ISIS or ISIL or DASH or Daesh or any of these things, for that insurgent level, it just stops. And these people basically, without the money to keep going, uh, fade away over a very brief period of time, uh, just relative few months. And a, and a lot of the um, that level of uh, uh, warfare is removed. Now, we do have a lot of stuff involved with, uh, at the very far end of things, with um, uh, military bases being shut down and troops being brought back. Again, all of this economic. And so the uh, trend, if you will, within our data sets is, is counter-war, is like anti-war, uh, not like in an anti-war pro protest, but rather in the uh, breakdown and, and re-enfoldment of a lot of the older um, uh, warfare kind of uh, uh, material back into the civilian society, just because we need it, just because we can't afford it anymore.